you need a handout sheet, just lift your hand right up and the ushers will see that you receive one. Take your Bibles and go to Proverbs chapter 10, if you would please. Proverbs chapter 10. And we're going to be breaking this chapter up into certain sections, as you see on your study sheet as we work through these. This begins, as we see on the study sheet, the second section of the book of Proverbs. This section deals with a variety of topics from finances, family, and fun. You like my alliteration there? And it says here, the scriptures deal with all aspects of life. God has given us the resources necessary for a life well-pleasing, first to God and to our fellow man. So we shouldn't take for granted that when we emphasize certain aspects of a particular book, that we're actually uh, downplaying any other aspect that the book uh, covers. For example, you know, it's common with me, I try to get a particular uh, theme for a book, and then I go off of that theme as I really go through the entire uh, book. For example, uh, Philippians being the joy book, we know that uh, uh, I look at Colossians as being the book that deals with the preeminence of Jesus Christ, and so on. And so then when I hit certain passages of Scripture, I use that overarching theme to try to actually bring maybe some things that I don't clearly understand uh, to light when I go off that basis. Same thing I do with the, what is referred to as the pastoral epistles. And so once you get a theme out, then it helps you as you interpret uh, certain passages. When you look at the book of Proverbs, it's a practical book dealing with how we get along with our fellow man, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't address other topics as well. That's what I'm trying to say tonight, okay? And so as we go through these chapters as well, uh, you know, Every single one of these Proverbs carries pretty much a message in and of itself. What I've tried to do as I've gone through these 31 chapters is I'm not trying to hit every single topic at that, in that particular chapter that it is dealt with because, for example, the tongue is a subject that's dealt with really throughout these 31 chapters. And so there'll be some lessons that we deal specifically and in more detail with that topic than we will at, say, another passage that talks about the tongue. And so if we stopped at each proverb and dealt extensively with the subject matter in that proverb, I don't think we'd ever get through. <laughs> and so what I've tried to do as I go through these chapters is just ask the Lord what He would want us to know at this particular time, what we should be bringing out as far as our uh, services are concerned. And so that's really the direction I go as I try to seek the mind of the Lord on what direction we should take in these uh, studies. You may uh, wonder at times why I don't address a certain topic, why I skip over a verse. Uh, and so that's just something maybe if you have a tweaking interest in that, that maybe the Lord's saying you need to study that out but I just, uh, I, there's no way I can deal with every single topic that is brought out in this passage of Scripture. I hope you understand. What I've also tried to do is many of these Proverbs stand alone. Each verse stands alone. And uh, what I've tried to do, though, is get an overall view of groups of verses, and then that's where I come up with my outlines as we go through the book of Proverbs. So once again, let me uh, read these, this introduction. I think you may have it up there. This chapter begins the second section of the book of Proverbs. And this section deals with a variety of topics from finances, family, and fun. So it addresses everything that we need to live a life well-pleasing first to God and then to our fellow man. You see the outline that I've come up with here in uh, this uh, particular chapter. The introduction to section two takes in uh, chapter uh, 2, uh, verse 1 here, and then the blessing of diligence. You have the blessing of covering others' imperfections, the blessing of work, the blessing of a controlled tongue, and then the blessing of a righteous life. And so we're going to work through this chapter this evening in the time that we have. And first of all, we see here the introduction to section 2. Let's read verse 1 together. The Proverbs of Solomon... A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is a heaviness of his mother. And so just as a way of introduction here, you notice that each proverb uh, contains a couplet. 
This is known as Hebrew parallelism, and these Proverbs show a striking contrast one with the other. And so I want us to work through these first four verses just in reading so that you can get the, the idea of what uh, the Lord is telling us here and how uh, Solomon laid these Proverbs out. So, so notice the verse two, the treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Verse three, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famous, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. So you see the contrast that's being made in these verses. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And so that's how he's laid out m many of these. I think there's only, in this second section, there's only maybe one or two Proverbs that don't follow this same idea, this same layout uh, in it. So uh, we see here the introduction to section two, verse one, and then number two, the blessing of diligence. And that's something that we find all throughout Proverbs as well. And so let's read verses two to 10. And the verses of two to 10, I'll just read again what we just read. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. So if you look at your study sheet again, it says diligence is the careful and persistent work or effort a person should develop as an important character trait. Okay, diligence is a careful and persistent work or an effort a person should develop as an important character trait. And of course, diligence is something that each and every one of us ought to strive for. Uh, I, I wrote here in my notes, anything worth doing is worth doing right. Okay, anything worth doing is worth doing right. And of course, Ecclesiastes chapter nine and verse 10, another portion of scripture that was, that was penned by Solomon, and he really tells us about a man and the rationalization of man in those 12 chapters. And he says this, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. In other words, what you're going to do, do now, and do it to the best of your ability. Notice here letter A, talent is not the subject here. And sometimes we, we will elevate talent to a certain level, and we really ought not do that because many people we find will begin with too much praise given to them because of talent that they've been blessed by God with, then they don't keep that, uh, that uh, character trait of diligence and uh, being careful in developing that character. They ride on that, that talent, that natural talent, rather than actually sharpening that, that edge and being everything that they could be as far as even say in music, learning the mechanics of music. Uh, many people find it uh, easy as a musician to maybe play an instrument by ear, but yet they can't play notes. And so it would behoove them not to just play by ear. Uh, there's nothing wrong with playing by ear. I've always found that a little difficult. But uh, anyway, uh, playing by ear, but yet at the same time, they ought to learn the mechanics of it. One thing that we know here that we've tried to develop is hymn playing because there are a lot of folks that will take piano and other instrument lessons from other uh, places and they'll learn the classics, the classical music, but yet then they get into a church service and they can't play the hymns uh, because there's a different approach to those. And so you need to really continue to be diligent 
in the work that God calls you to do. You should never just rest on talent. Notice here again, talent is not the subject here, but doing your best and not quitting are emphasized. Verse four, once again, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And of course, uh, you know, being from an agricultural society that the Jews were addressing here, it's talking about farming and business and things of that nature, but you can apply that same principle to every area of life. God blesses work. God blesses diligence. And so notice talent is not the subject here. Letter B, it is good to consider the opportunities that God gives and pursue them with careful, persistent effort. In other words, you should always continue to be learning. Uh, you should always be reaching forward. And uh, you should always be seeking to learn more uh, than you've ever known before. And there should be no end to your learning. Uh, it, you should, in business they say, if you don't continue to grow, then you're going to end up losing your market share. Uh, inflation, if you do the same amount of work last year as you do, uh, this year as you do last year, then of course you're gonna fall behind because just simple inflation will eat up the profit. And so you need to continue to uh, go forward. And so that means you have to stay on the cutting edge of your industry. You have to stay up with what the industry is going towards. Why? So that you can compete. And so the Lord uh, knows exactly what he's trying to uh, get us as Christians to understand as well. That's why it's interesting that he says in the New Testament that the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. And it seems like many times we as believers are playing catch up in many areas of life when really we ought to be on the cutting edge simply because the Holy Spirit of God, who knows everything, will lead us into all truth and help us in the work that he's given us to do. That doesn't mean, though, that uh, if you are uh, in a certain, let's say, schoolwork, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you're going to get straight A's all the time. It could be that God has not blessed you in a particular area uh, in that way, but you can still do your best. I say this. If C work is your best, do C work. Uh, if B work is your best, do B work. If A work is your best, do A work. But if you can do A work and you're satisfied with a C, you're not being diligent. And that's something that you and I have to really wrestle with ourselves as well as meet God one day. Uh, I, that song that we closed out the service Sunday night, I wonder if I've done my best for Jesus, you know? It's so important for us to understand this principle of life, the blessing of diligence. And that's a truth and a character trait that you'll find through these 31 chapters uh, here in the book of Proverbs. Number three, this is probably where we'll spend a little bit more of the time tonight, and the blessing of covering others' imperfections. The blessing of covering others' imperfections. I think it's a sad state of affairs that many people glory in dirt. They glory in knowing the trash about someone. They glory in magnifying the faults of others. There's something in our depraved nature that we like to hear the bad news on someone else. Uh, and we, it turns us into nothing but busybodies and gossipers and whispers and backbiters. But the Bible is very clear, and I'm so glad that it's clear, and it, uh, you know, as far as our fellow man is concerned. But I wish that we could understand this in light of our relationship with God. I'm so glad that God forgives sin. I'm so glad that when He forgives sin, and you know, we know the verses, and we know the truth. That he takes our sins and he buries them in the depths of the sea and he remembers no, them no more. He's not going to dig them up. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. And when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that means when he cleans it up, it's not dirty anymore. So when he cleans you up, you're not dirty anymore. And so in some respects, you have to get past your own failures in your own mind once you've sought God's forgiveness. 
And then it, it's true, you may have some consequences you have to live through, but understand, he can give you a renewed vision even in the midst of going through a rotten crop that you've sown because of past sins. And he can teach you new lessons and he can give you a new ministry, I guess you could say, if you look at it that way, just like Psalm 51 with David. David said, you know, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And then right after he said, you know, if you, if you do all this, Lord, and when you forgive me, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. You see, then he says, I'm gonna take these lessons that I learned through my failure, and I'm gonna help others. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things are behind, that are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But it's sad that we live in a day and age, and I guess it's always been, but we just uh, see it so prevalent and, and active seemingly today that uh, people just glory in finding fault with someone and then magnifying that uh, to such an extent. And we ought to be brothers and sisters in Christ that will forgive as God has forgiven us. And so the blessing of covering others' per imperfections, let's read verses 11 to 14. The Bible here says, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Letter A in your study sheet, it says this, this verse in no way legitimizes sin in any form. And so that's something we have to understand. <laughs> And I think I say somewhere along here that you have to understand context when you're looking at a particular passage of Scripture. We're not, the Lord in no way, shape, or form uh, winks at sin. He commands all men everywhere to repent, the Scripture says. But there is this aspect, though, that as God deals personally with us, and as we deal personally with one another, we don't need to tell the whole world just everything bad about somebody that we know. And so God doesn't do that to us. I mean, God's never come to me and said, Mike, let me tell you about Brian Helm. And he never just sits there and tells me about Brother Helm. He deals with Brother Helm. And uh, he, he, he's not going to come to you about me. He's going to deal with me. And then there's some, there's some aspects that if I'm in certain sins and I have a certain position, that of course has to be dealt with in a different way, but he's laid out that plan in the scriptures. So he's scripturally given us the framework to solve all of our problems with our fellow man as well as with our God. And so we need to understand that principle though as it says here in verse 12, but love covereth all sins. Okay, and so I mean like, uh, you don't, I trust you don't sit there and say, let me tell you about my spouse. All the problems that I have with my spouse. For one, I'm just sort of giving an example because I have no problems with my spouse. I have no problems with Brenda. Now, Brenda may have problems with me, but at the same time, I don't want her going around telling everybody all my weaknesses and shortcomings, and it wouldn't be wise for her to say that either to anybody, right? And you wouldn't want your spouse to go around talking negatively about you and you shouldn't talk negatively about your spouse. So when you go out for coffee and you're going through issues and whatnot, maybe you need to get with your spouse and you may need to resolve those issues between the two of you. And if not, then you may need to go see someone that will keep their big mouth shut and help you through that issue rather than everybody and their brother knowing your problem. Because you see, when everybody and their brother has your problem accentuated, it's sometimes hard to live that down, isn't it? And then the devil plays with your mind and it plays with their mind and no one is the better for it. And so the scripture here knows what it's talking about here, amen? God is trying to say us, look, if you love someone, then you ought to seek to keep the negative aspects of their life uh, quiet. You should. 
Okay, notice it says here in your study sheet, it says, when hatred takes root in a life, then it looks for opportunities to manifest itself in seeking to destroy the object of that hatred. That's verse 12 again. Hatred stirreth up strifes. And so it says here, uh, the first bullet point here, or the only one here, it will look for opportunities to advertise and stir up conflict with others to add credence to their own reasoning for hatred. Okay, so hatred stirs up strife. You know, we talk about stirring up the good things, the gifts that God has given us, but here hatred will work the opposite way and will actually stir up trouble. And there's some people that glory, and what I say is they like to drop a bomb or a hand grenade and walk away and then look back and see it explode and see what damage they can cause. That's wicked. That's wicked. And it ought not be named amongst the church of Jesus Christ. And letter C, it says here, if you truly love and care for someone, you are concerned about their ability to function after the sin is dealt with. Okay, let me read that again. If you truly love and care for someone, you are concerned about their ability to function after the sin is dealt with. And so that's so vital to understand that you ought to be seeking to minimize that so that person, that sin, once it's dealt with, so that that person can minister effectively and that they can have that fresh start. Just like God does for you on a regular basis as you take your sins, your imperfections, and you ask God to forgive you. And maybe someone comes along the line and shows you a blind spot that you have and so rebukes you or points that area out so that you can get it right. And so he ought to keep it right there quiet and because it's a solved issue, you take care of it and then you go on about your business. But just because someone comes to you and says, you know, I have a problem with so-and-so and you're not dealing with so-and-so in a certain way. And uh, you, you know, that's, that's not really your business to follow up on that. Because it's not your business. It doesn't really involve you you see. And so what happens a lot of times is we want to be busybodies in other men's matters. I know I'm stepping on some toes. <laughs> amen. Yeah. Amen. And let's look what it says here in Proverbs chapter 17, Proverbs chapter 17, just a few pages over in verse nine, I think it is. The Bible here says, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. You know what happens when you start talking about somebody else and then you have that dynamic at work in the situation, then pride gets seated in there. And there are a lot of times where someone, once they deal with the sin factor, then they have to overcome the pride factor. And it, gets, it takes sometimes a simple issue that's being dealt with, and it complicates it all the more. Let's go to uh, 2 Peter, I believe it is. Let's see if I, 1 Peter chapter 4, excuse me. 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse 8, the Bible says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Remember, charity, uh, they talk about the love chapter for one sin, but a multitude of sins. And so you and I need to understand that principle of life and that principle that God gives us and that we practice ourselves on a regular basis. We're recipients of charity. Okay, number one, I see this. You want people to see the best in others. This ought to be your mindset. You know, sometimes uh, people that uh, maybe they've gone through some deep waters, maybe they've uh, had some issues in their life and, and maybe their sin has had to be confronted and whatnot. And you know, uh, they have taken care of that. They've repented of that. Uh, God has wiped the slate clean. We've wiped the slate clean. Many times though, I find that some folks think that maybe we're holding a grudge against them. And I trust that that's not true about us. That when somebody has gotten right, we ought to be right there side by side helping them. 
as it says in Galatians chapter six and verse one, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you were to fall flat on your face and be in sin, wouldn't you love to have someone come along and tenderly and kindly confront you for your sin with a burdened heart and maybe even a tear in the eye and help you through that situation. And once you get right with God, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you want somebody to come alongside and help restore you and be kind to you? You know, we, we are the ones that, as the saying goes, we shoot our own wounded. And we're so vicious at times, never made people feel comfortable in their sin. But at the same time, after we are confronting them and they begin to respond that way, we ought to be right there with them to help them up out of that, that pit that they've fallen into. Amen? Notice what it says here as well. You want people to see the best in others. And then number two, God has a plan of restoration. God has a plan of restoration. And you know, sometimes if you're not part of the restoring process, you ought to just be satisfied in glory and not knowing. Why do we feel like we gotta know every jot and tittle of detail of someone who's gone through trouble? Even in a church discipline matter, all someone needs to know is look, this area, this thing has been dealt with, the demands have been met according to the scriptures and those involved in the restoring process, and then we ought to say glory to God. Glory to God, that's it. But people just always want to uh, find out, you know, there's got to be something more to that. And they begin to try to dig this up, this, and then the mind runs wild and you start building on that scenario and you've got all kinds of stuff happening. Those are vain imaginations. And if we're not careful, we will have evil surmisings. And that's wicked. And we need to understand that principle of life uh, ourselves. God has a plan of restoration. I want to look at a few of these and notice here number two, I say context is important when dealing with these various person to person issues. Let's go here with the first one mentioned in Matthew 18. And normally when we deal with Matthew 18, we sort of use this passage and it's proper to just also show that the church was in existence uh, before Acts chapter two. And we know that in Mark 3 and Matthew 10, we know that Jesus called the disciples. The church did not start with John the Baptist. The church didn't start before then. The church, or after then, with Pentecost, the church started with Jesus. He's the founder of the church. And that's from, uh, you also see that reiterated in, in chapter 16 of Matthew. And then here you have a discipline aspect of life brought forth in chapter 18, and the word church is mentioned, the ecclesia is mentioned again. That's a called out assembly. And so let's look at verse 15. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So in other words, you try to solve the problem amongst yourselves, the other person. And you know, if you go and you get that worked out, then you don't need to say anything about it. You don't need to call for a prayer meeting. You don't need to call the prayer channel and say, you know, I, pray for me and this brother of mine that we're having these difficulties and da, 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 da. No, that's not what the Bible says. You can give an unspoken request, but what you ought to do is go to that brother, go to that sister and try to resolve that issue. And if that issue gets resolved, end the story. You know, when, when God comes to you and convicts you, there you are in the morning or whenever you have your devotions and you're reading the Bible and God all of a sudden points something out and says, you know what, I need to get that right. And so then you get that right, you confess it to the Lord, he forgives you, you know what, that's the end for him. He's not going to bother you anymore because he's not going to remember it anymore. He's not going to hold it against you anymore. And if that sin gets brought back up, you can just mark it down that it's old slew foot the devil. He's come along trying to get you to get hang on that stuff rather than claim God's forgiveness. And that's where you need to just say, devil, leave me alone. Lord, we've taken care of this. Devil, I command you to flee 
under the authority and name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. And Lord, I give that to you. Devil, get out of here. And you say, you talk like that? Yes, you talk like that to the devil. I like what uh, A.W. Tozer said. He says, I talk back to the devil. He says, I tell him to leave. Oh, Martin Luther says at one point he felt the devil so real in his room, he picked up the old inkwell and he threw it against the wall. And he never cleaned it up because it was a reminder of the reality of the devil. And we placate so much and play so much, we need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. And it's the devil who will come and remind us of our past. The Lord won't. Like I said already, when he... He does the just thing. He does the right thing. He forgives. And remember again what forgive means. It means to send away. He sends it away. And if God has forgiven you and sent it away, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. He's the one that declares righteous. And if God says that your sins are forgiven, my friend, your sins are forgiven. And anyone or any a spirit being that comes to you and any thought that crosses your mind to say, well, you know, he, he probably didn't do that for me is a lie. And you need to cast down those imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we need to do that in some, some uh, a literal sense of that where we actually say, look, I am casting this out. And that means we don't keep thinking about it. Amen. And notice what it says here in verse, it says, uh, verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then you take others. You see, but each time you're, you're, the Lord is saying, keep that realm of knowledge as small as possible. You know, if someone has done wrong and then you, you know that they've done wrong, why do you have to know the details of that wrong? Why do you need to know the nitty gritty details of that? Uh, And when they do right and they make it public saying, look, I just want everybody to know I've rededicated my life to the Lord. Then what more do we need to know? Except, hey, they've gotten something right. Praise God. They're in fellowship. You know, (laughs) amen. Notice what it says. If he neglect to hear thee, verse 17, uh, to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. What do you do with a heathen man and a publican? You try to win them. (laughs) And yes, there are some parameters given to us in that, but it doesn't mean that we go and fellowship with them if they will not hear us. And there's that aspect of church discipline that has to be uh, enacted as I list some scripture here from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 5. The the one who was in immorality and refused to repent But then we have the corresponding passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where he had gotten right. But the church was going to say, oh no, we've church disciplined you. You're in persona non grata. Uh, There's no way we're going to take you in. You did wrong. And, And what did Paul say? Paul said, look, take him back. He's gotten right. He's not in that sin anymore. And if he's not in that sin anymore, then you need to take him back into the fellowship because the fellowship is for believers. And he's obviously a believer. And so now you need to take him back. and That way he doesn't what? Get overcome with much sorrow. And then it says, because you and I have to be careful that we don't give an advantage to Satan in our lives over that kind of behavior. And I wonder how many Christians are in bondage tonight to the evil world, the spirit world, because of the spirit of unforgiveness and hypocrisy in the way they treat brothers and sisters in Christ who have confessed their sin, got right with God, and are seeking to serve God, and yet they keep getting held down. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and go here to, uh, well, Philemon is a great example, isn't it? I think it's 25 verses, Philemon. If memory serves me correct, it's definitely been slipping in these later years. But you notice here with Philemon, you know, uh, this deals with the subject of forgiveness. 
Paul even said, you know, this guy's gotten saved. And he says, look, if he's done something wrong, Onesimus, if he's done something wrong, then put that on my account. What was he doing? He was practicing Galatians 6.1. See, the book of Galatians with the Pauline epistles, that was the first book we believe that, that Paul penned. So he's just practicing what he's preaching. And you see, you have, the, you have the aspect of, hey, he knew when to bring the rod out, but he also knew when to have the loving hand, you know? And we need to understand that balance as believers. That's why he says in Galatians 6, 1, ye which are spiritual. Just because somebody's a Christian doesn't mean that they're spiritual. and doesn't mean they qualify to be part of the restoring process. And so it's so important for us to understand some of these principles here, okay? And uh, so finally, I, I thought about reading this entire passage, but I'm not going to. I'll let you read this, okay? And see how Paul treats Onesimus and, and so on. And uh, then if you look, uh, there's God, I say here, God has a plan of restoration. You have Romans 13, tells us how to deal with criminal matters. And 1 Corinthians 5, moral matters. And uh, let's uh, notice here, context is important when dealing with these various person-to-person -person issues. Number three, forgiveness is vital to your overall spiritual health. Forgiveness is vital to your overall spiritual health. Bitterness will eat you alive. And uh, you need to forgive, regardless if any relationship is ever right this way, you need to forgive. You're going to have situations come up in your life. People may take advantage of you. You may have the impression that they've done you wrong, whether it's legitimate or illegitimate. At the same time, you need to forgive. If you don't forgive, you're going to be the one that suffers for it. And so the Bible's so plain on this, uh, this principle. Let's go to Romans 12, if you would. I don't have that in your notes. But Romans 12, just want to look at verse 17. A lot of times what happens is we think when we hold on to a spirit of unforgiveness or bitterness that when we cop an attitude and we alienate ourselves or we, uh, we are mean towards someone or we ignore someone or something along those lines, we feel like, boy, we're, we're showing them. And what we're doing is we're hurting ourselves. Because you see, God knows a better way to deal with someone who's done us wrong. In uh, Romans chapter 12, and let's look at verse 17, it says, Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now notice he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So you just need to say, Lord, I choose to forgive so-and-so for what they did to me. Doesn't mean that you're saying that they did right. But at the same time, you're saying, Lord, I am not the one to exact the judgment. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to let this go so that I can live in freedom, and then I'm going to give that to you, and you handle that. And it's amazing the freedom that you will feel in regards to that. I'm going to give an illustration, a personal illustration. When something happened in our family 20-something years ago, it was a very, very traumatic thing. We've had several traumatic things happen in our family. But at the same time, this was a very traumatic thing for us. And I remember that this individual was part and parcel of a problem and really aided in the situation. And I can remember driving and I had, Brenda was in the vehicle with me. And so I got on the phone and uh, on the cell phone there, it must have been one of those long ones, no. Uh, and I got on the cell phone and I remember calling this person. And uh, they did not pick up, but the answer machine clicked on. And I gave them a piece of my mind. And uh, I let them know that they were sinning, that they did wrong, and so on and so on. Man, I had the scripture down. But as soon as I, I hung that thing up, God smote me and says, Mike, you didn't do right. 
you should not have done that. And what I did is I argued with the Lord a bit. I said, Lord, you know they did wrong. He said, yeah, but it's not your business to go and try to make that, that right. You have no part in this. And you let me do my part and you do your part. I said, but Lord, you know what? If I, if I call them back and apologize, then they're going to think it's all right for what they did. Because you know what happens when you apologize. You want to you say, well, I'm sorry, but, blah, 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 blah. and then you have at it anyway with them. And the Lord says, no, I don't want you to do that. You need to call back and straighten up that call. Okay. I told Brenda about it, and, you know, I'm, I'm wrestling through that. So then I, I picked up the phone, and I called. And you know what? This person picked up. Oh, where was the answering machine when you wanted it? <laughs> you know? And so what I did is I, I let that person know. I said, look, I left you a voicemail, and uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I'm at fault. I was wrong to do it. Please forgive me. They said they did, and I hung up the phone. And you know what? I don't know if that situation has ever been made right that that person did. But you know what? I don't need to know. Because I couldn't do anything about it anyway. But what I could do is I could turn it over to God and I could be free. There's something about being free. Okay? And it doesn't mean that you're justifying anything, but you're just saying, God, you know the Achilles heel of an individual. You know how to handle this better than I do. And if there's something I need to do, please tell me. And then if there's something that I should just stay out of, just let me stay out of it. But I want to walk in your freedom. I want to be able to, that I, I can read my Bible and pray and that I can be faithful to you and that I can have my prayers answered and so on. Otherwise, it's just going to eat, as we would say, eat your lunch. And you don't need that. Life is too short and too precious. Amen? And so... Uh, notice that vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And remember what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, some men's sins are known beforehand, and some men's sins they follow after. Now, we would like at times to have our enemies and those that do us wrong. We want them to get theirs right now. And you know, sometimes God sees to it that he will justify you in the sight of others. But then sometimes he won't. But bear in mind, there is coming a judgment day. And all the rights and wrongs are going to be made right, right there at the judgment seat of Christ for the believer and the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the unsaved. And so no one's going to get by with anything. I won't get by with anything. You won't get by with anything. Those that have done you wrong, they're not getting by with anything. But you need to live in freedom. You and I need to live in that freedom. Amen. I can't stress that enough. Let's look at this passage of scripture, Matthew 18. Matthew 18. This is a great illustration that the Lord gives. That same passage that we saw in verses 15, 16, and 17, but then he really drives this truth home. And it's really telling in the light of spiritual warfare as well. In Matthew 18, verse 23, it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, and Jesus is speaking here. He says, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now, I liken us in a situation like that. We have been forgiven for so much. We, this was a debt that could not be paid by this man. And so the, the Lord of that servant said, you know what, I forgive you. What was he doing? He was writing it off. Folks, there, there may just come a time in your life where you just need to write it off. I give the illustration of a guy in Bible college that I borrowed money to, and he said he'd pay me back at a certain time, and he never paid me back. And, you know, that used to just sit in my cross sometimes. And I can remember my brother-in-law who lived, at, he's in heaven now, but he lived in Mohawk, Tennessee. He's walking down the street and meets this guy 
that he didn't know that he, this guy and I had gone to school together, but then they, this guy, they introduced themselves to each other. That's what they do down in the South. And right off the street, just talking, just jawing, you know. And it says, well, do you know Mike Sullivan? And he says, yeah, that's my brother-in-law. Well, my brother-in-law calls us and was talking on the phone, I think, to Brenda. And when I heard that this guy, was, you know what came to my mind? That guy owes me $50. <laughs> and right away, the devil was trying to get a hold of me. And uh, I, I just said, no, 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 no. I, I gave that, I gave that up. You know, and I live in the freedom of that today. But at the same time, he still owes me $50. But I don't, I, I've forgiven him. You know what I'm saying? He may still owe me that debt, but that's up to God how that's all rectified. Because I've said, you know what? I'm not gonna have my joy hinge on $50. I'm not gonna have my joy hinge on 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 or a million dollars. He says this, he says, but that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence, about a day's wage. And says, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And that's like we are. Our brother and sister in Christ owes us something. And so what are we gonna do? We're gonna exact it from him. We have been, we have been forgiven a debt that there's no way we could ever pay. And yet we're going to squeeze our brother, sister in Christ. And his fellow servant fell down, verse 29, at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. He says this, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You need to forgive. If there's one thing I, I wish we could, we could take home with us tonight is we need to forgive. We need to le learn to forgive one another. Amen. Forgiveness is vital to your overall spiritual health. And then number uh, four, I'm gonna just read through this because we need to get to the prayer time. And uh, we'll be hitting on some of these topics in more detail uh, in the coming weeks anyway. The blessing of work, we see here verses 15 and 16 of our text. And it says these words, it says, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, the destruction of the poor is their poverty. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. And I say here, the emphasis here is honest work. There are those who try and take shortcuts as well as those who try and take advantage of others. We should seek the betterment of those around us, seek to make others a success. Let me encourage you, if you work for a particular business, whether that businessman is saved or lost, ask God to place his good hand of blessing on your life, to prosper the work of your hands, to make that businessman, that business a success. We, do you realize that if you make that businessman a success, you're gonna reap some of the benefits too? It's called a paycheck. And by your hard work and your giving of yourself, glory to God through your work as unto the Lord, then you will develop a platform from which to witness. But if you're a slacker and you're a complainer and you're a moaner and groaner, then what's gonna happen is, is you're, you're just ruining your testimony. No one's gonna to wanna to listen to you. It's a smear on the name of Jesus Christ. And so the emphasis here is on honest work. And then we should seek the betterment of those around us. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verses six to 15, I'd encourage you to read that. Number five, the blessing of a controlled tongue. 
And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of verses that deal with the tongue here in the book of Proverbs. So we'll be able to deal more in detail with this. Letter A, we make a great error by not allowing ourselves to be corrected. Look at God's choice servants. I don't know of too many of them as an example to us that weren't corrected. Paul, Peter, they were all corrected. You and I will need correction from time to time. Remember Hebrews chapter 12, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, ye are then bastards and not sons. What's he saying is, look, you and I need correction from time to time. And so we need to understand that. We make a great error by not allowing ourselves to be corrected. Letter B, the outflow of Jesus' life was that he fed the multitudes, not only physically, but also spiritually. The remaining amount was greater than the starting amount. Those who walk in the spirit feed those around them and find afterwards an abundance left over. And that's the power of the tongue. And then number six, and lastly, the blessing of a righteous life. God's way is the best way for today and for eternities tomorrow. We'll read that again. God's way is the best way for today and for eternities tomorrow. And then the next and last point here. Notice the ongoing contrast expressed. It would do us well to read and meditate on these verses and I'll read verses 22. It says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. It is as sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding hath wisdom. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. What I'm hoping you're getting with me reading this is just certain points of meditation. Just, it would do us good just sometimes to read the scripture and just say, just like when you read the word Selah in the Psalms, it says Selah, with that, that's a rest, a musical rest. And you go Selah, and that means stop here, think about this, meditate on this. And with these Proverbs, it would do us good when we think about the righteous life that we're seeking to live as believers. Just stop and think about these. As the whirlwind, verse 25, passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. You know, why would you want to be in the camp of the wicked when you read a passage like this? It says here, as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his most holy word. Let's all stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, please.